Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, and early good morning, depends on where you are, uh, in which continent. Uh, continent. So today we're going to have uh, the seventh and the last uh, public lectures on corporate co governance for the school year of 2021. Uh, uh, I'm the director of Institute for Corporate Governance, ICG, at Caddy School of Business, uh, Indiana University. The ICG was founded in 2004. So co-hosted with the ECGI, the European uh, Corporate Governance Institute and IOS Ostrom workshop, we started this public lecture series on corporate governance uh, in November, 2021. So we want to contribute to the debate on corporate governance issues, especially what the challenges that corporate board are facing in the current environment with big data, new technology, compliance, uh, disclosure, and climate risk, and so on. So far, we've conducted six lectures. Uh, today's is number seven. We started with the ESG, Do We Need It? And Does It Work? by Alex Ekman from IOBS. And then uh, Professor Michael Westbach started the talk of the traditional director monitoring, risk reception, board network, and directors monitoring. And then we had a mini series on the involvement and the role of institutional investors. So Todd Gormley from WashU talk about the role of indexers and uh, Alan Broff from Duke was talking about uh, hedge fund activism. It's called governance by persuasion. So all these four lectures we recorded and all the materials are available on our website. And here we comes to the mini series um, corporate governance and data and technology. So we started this talk last December by Wei Jiang from Columbia and there her focus is how would corporate governance respond to the big data and new technology. So her focus is on the corporate governance side. And Angie and Scott from my IU uh, Caddy School of Business, my colleague, talk about the data, on data ownership, privacy and related issues. And today is number three of this mini series uh, is about the future of cybersecurity. So our speakers are uh, Justin uh, Grace, uh, Charlie Lewis, and Jeff Castle from McKinsey and Company. Uh, Justin is a Kelly alumni, and he did a lot of wonderful things for the Kelly School of Business. Today's moderator is my colleague, uh, Dr. Andy Raymond. Uh, she was the speaker of uh, Who Owns Your Data? So. She will be the best one to moderate uh, today's uh, lecture. So again, all the videos, slides, right up for Q and A's will be posted on, on our website. You will also receive an email with all the materials that you need. A really quick introduction of our moderator, uh, Dr. Angie Raymond is a social professor in the uh, Department of Business Law and Ethics uh, of Cali School of Business. And she has many, many buzzwords, but the most important thing here is she's the director of the program on data management information governance at Austrian Workshop, our co-host of the entire series. And Angie is involved in many um, exciting areas, developing areas like online dispute resolution, uh, resolution, data governance, artificial intelligence, blockchain, smart contract, and many of the buzzword today, uh, Angie is collecting almost all of them. So without further ado, uh, Angie, the lecture, the podium, and the screen are all yours. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. It's my privilege uh, to moderate this panel today of these just incredibly distinguished speakers. And if you haven't you know, had a chance to look at their bios, um, yeah, please do, because we are very fortunate to hear from them today on such a, a timely topic. So as June uh, said earlier, at, we're being joined by Justin Grease. Now, Grease, uh, Justin is a partner at McKinsey's company and company in Ch the Chicago office, but he's the leader of the McKinsey uh, digital and risk uh, and resilience practices. And he focuses on cybersecurity, cloud technology, strategy, and digital transformation. Uh, joining him today is then Charlie Lewis. He's a cyber expert, associate partner. He, his phrase is he seeks to protect the world's best known brands through cybersecurity, which I think is a lofty goal. And I hope you're accomplishing that. Uh, he focuses on digital human risk. So we absolutely need to reach out to him and I need more conversations in this area. And of course, then also is Jeffrey Casso. 
He's a cyber expert and associate partner. He focuses on market growth strategy and is passionate about bringing market next generation cybersecurity offerings uh, and moonshots. So I'm gonna turn it over to you without further ado. And uh, my job is to moderate. So as this, this happens, of course, I'm going to be watching all the different places where information can come into me. And I am not going to be shy. I will interrupt. So if you have a question before we move on, please ask. It's the best way to become engaged in this conversation, but also to understand what's being presented to you. Um, OK, I will turn it over now to you all. Perfect. Thank you, Angie. Let me just confirm. You can see my screen OK? Everything's coming through all right? Okay, perfect. Well, welcome. And June, thank you so much for having us. Angie, thank you so much for the very kind introduction. Uh, joined, as, as, as you mentioned, with, by uh, Charlie Lewis and, and Jeff Kaysa. We're, we're thrilled to be with you here today. And thank you, everyone, for joining. So we thought we would do something kind of fun today. Uh, we thought we would look into the future and, and try to project out what the future of cybersecurity could be in the upcoming years. We put a time horizon of about 10 to 15 years out. And we're gonna do that in kind of three different ways using three different lenses. The first way is through looking at the cybersecurity provider market today. Those who provide hardware, software, solutions, services, and look at it from their standpoint. What are the challenges that they are seeing and the trends that they are trying to solve for? The second thing is looking at the, we, we strongly believe in the, in the connection between digital and business trends, and then trying to assess the impact of that for cybersecurity, cybersecurity organizations in general. And we're going we're gonna to do that in, in section two. And then three, we're going to try to tackle the future-proofing question. What are the very tangible and tactical steps that cybersecurity organizations and companies can do to ready themselves for the challenges that we explore in section one and section two. So we're really excited about it. Um, we hope this is engaging. Please ask a ton of questions. Angie's gonna, gonna interrupt and, and interject and, and hopefully we'll have a good dialogue along the way. So I won't bore you with our introductions, but what I will tell you is that the basis of this talk and all of the conclusions that we're coming to are based upon our serving the market, working with over 500 different cyber transformations or 500 different clients, 50 different cyber transformations that we've done in the past four years, uh, 50 plus software, hardware services providers uh, that we've, we've spoken to over the past uh, 20, uh, two couple of years, 2020, 2021, and, and certainly 2022. And then we regular, regularly convene a round table of chief information security officers, chief, chief risk officers, chief legal officers. And we, we talk to about a hundred of, uh, of them per quarter and pull data, do research, both qualitative and quantitative research. So a lot of the, the, the material, the conclusions, and the data that we're going to talk about today are based on those interactions. I do want to acknowledge several colleagues who are not on the call, and we've listed them on the slides. A lot of research, a lot of wonderful insight uh, has been provided by them. So certainly, we're, we're standing on the, the shoulders of giants, and, and their research has contributed to a lot of the conclusions that we've come to. OK, so just starting. With, with what is cybersecurity? This was, this was an important slide just as, as a level set. We believe that it's composed of eight core capabilities. We're gonna to refer to these capabilities throughout the, the, the presentation, but fundamentally it's protecting the confidentiality, availability and integrity of data and making sure that we're protecting the things that matter most to a company. These eight capabilities, and you know, just as, as background as to why we put these capabilities together. Oftentimes we'll, we'll talk to boards, we'll talk to executives, we'll talk to business, business executives that, that want to know what does good cybersecurity look like? What are all the functions? You know, they, they know what their finance organization should look like, they know what their marketing organization should look like, but cybersecurity being a relatively new function, what are all of the functions that, that make up cybersecurity? And we believe that there's, there's eight of them. We're gonna dive into these in greater detail uh, later. So I'm not going to, going to spend a ton of time on, on going through these, uh, but I wanted to just flash this up that these are the eight core elements of what we believe constitutes a well-run, 
and mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive cybersecurity organization. I will revisit these later in the later in the presentation. Okay, so with that, we're going to dive into section one, uh, the cybersecurity market, and I'll pass it over to my colleague Jeff Caso. And by the way, just I'll, I'll preface this: we are all in the same room, sitting on the same <laughs> side of the table. And so if you if you see me looking like this, I'm looking at Jeff and I'm looking at Charlie. And if you see a hand creep into the shot. <laughs> That's also by hand. Which Thank also you. implies the view of Chicago behind us is real. <laughs> it's not, is not a green screen. It is real. <laughs> um, All right, I'll pass it to Jeff. Thank you, Justin, for uh, teeing this section up. I have the task here of talking about the cybersecurity market today. So today, tomorrow, future, we're going to focus here on today. And I'll, I'll start, we said we we're going to make this a discussion. We'll start with the poll question. And this is a bit of a layup. We're going to start easy and the poll questions will get harder as we go on. If you could, using the polling feature, the question here is agree, disagree. I believe cybersecurity is a critical business capability on par with other business functions for companies today. And we'll open that poll now and give folks about 30 seconds to answer. Yeah, we're not testing your knowledge on these. These are, this is just purely whether or not you agree, disagree in your perception. All right, maybe two more seconds. All right. All right. <laughs> we're happy with that. Well, well, sure. But the, the purpose of this poll is, so what we can see here is the vast majority, right? 80% strongly agree, 97% agree in some way, shape or form that cybersecurity is important today. So that's, that's the foundation for this first section on where we are today. Let's advance forward one slide because the point that I wanna make is we all agree cybersecurity is important. However, we're at a critical inflection point in how customer needs are coalescing with capabilities of attackers and with uh, underlying trends in market and technology that is provided to defenders. And part of this, this talk, what one, one goal of mine in all conversations like this that I lead is to demystify some buzzwords. So I'll, I'll start with the answer which is here are the six trends that we think are shaping cybersecurity today. And then I'll dive into each of them. We'll talk a bit about cloud. And what this talks here about is think old days of data centers, servers, physical hardware and infrastructure, as that moves to things that are more as a service, like logging into Gmail, which you can do from your phone or you can do it from your laptop. And as we think about Amazon and Microsoft have these massive cloud farms, the edge is dissolving. It used to be a very simple way to do cybersecurity. Simple is a relative term, but that you could put a firewall around uh, the corporate headquarters and you could therefore say that everything inside that perimeter is secure. The point here with number one, hybrid and multi-cloud, we'll get into more detail, is that that perimeter is going away. And with work from home, we're all in different locations. What does that mean in terms of how a chief information security officer has to think about securing the, the enterprise but also in terms of the market, what do the vendors have to provide you? They can't just give you the same old firewall they used to. Number two, a bit more on that, that software as a service and what this means in terms of decentralization. It used to be the case that enterprises had their own applications. You would log into your university exchange account and that would log you in directly to the server that your institution or university or enterprise had direct control over. As we use things like Gmail or the old days of, of even the hotmails of the world, they own security of those email accounts that you are directly interfacing with. When you download a file off of Gmail, that file now enters the enterprise perimeter without having ever gone through the same security controls that they used to. Um, topic three here is a really important one about regulation. This started with the European Union and GDPR and privacy. Uh, every time you go on a website and you click accept or reject all cookies, you have the European Union to thank. But over time, I mean, that's really just become the, the standard. And we've seen other countries, India, Brazil, to some extent, Russia, the state of California, having similar legislation that's come out. We'll talk about automation and software development. We'll also talk about this idea that the expectation of cybersecurity products is no longer that you just flag when you find something. It used to be, right, your Norton or your Symantec antivirus on your desktop at home would tell you, hey, we found something. Well, terrific, now what do you go do with that? And because the amount of time that it, you, uh, a defender has to really defend against an attack before it takes control of a the network these days with things like ransomware attacks, 
is just so short, moving away from just detection to actual response is a key theme on the cyber market today. And then lastly, we'll talk about consolidation and are there a thousand companies or are there 10 that you should worry about if you have cybersecurity responsibility for your enterprise. So I'll dive into to each of these from here. So I'm excited about this slide. There's a lot of data, but because it's coming out of some really recent research that we did just quarter one of, of this year, 500 different security buyers we spoke to, we asked them about three years ago today and three years from now, what does your company's IT environment look like? Is it data centers? Is it cloud? What's important to take away from the slide is what we've highlighted in red here, which is to say that the way that companies approach the cloud differs dramatically by the type of company that it is. The less regulated businesses we see here, yeah, they're growing their presence in cloud environments, but only by 3% per year. If you compare that to the highly regulated enterprises, they're growing that 11% per year. That's a, a three to four X multiplier in the pace at which companies are moving to the cloud. And if you think about this from the perspective of attackers and defenders, understanding that we're in this mix where companies will have data centers, they'll have private cloud, they'll have public cloud, they'll have these, these competing types of infrastructure that are trying to work in harmony. The implication is that this is an increase in complexity. And it is challenging as a defender, as an IT executive, as someone with responsibility for cybersecurity to make sure that the same policies are applied no matter what infrastructure type you're talking about. So this, this first theme here, where we are today is there's a lot of complexity with regard to this, this thing that is the cloud. The second point is about software as service, SaaS, talking about the use of things like Gmail or Workday or Salesforce, instead of applications that used to be built by your company, you're now buying these things and accessing them through the web. The point on this chart here is take a look at that top line for SaaS and growth over time, three years ago to three years from now, we see a step change in how many cybersecurity capabilities are expected to be consumed via SaaS. And what this implies is it's a really interesting inflection point for enterprises that made decisions about the security tools that it wanted as part of its environment five, 10 years ago, 15 years ago in many cases. Because of this change in expectation, you could imagine that vendors and providers in the market are going to respond. And what that, that leads us to is today might be the right time to capitalize on these changing uh, headwinds and tailwinds in the market. Regulation, I mentioned in my intro, Europe, GDPR, that's all important. But the fact of the matter is that 75% of countries have significant data protection laws. The majority of these have been penned in the last five years. And what this leads us to is an interesting world where enterprises right now are debating how can they have the same cybersecurity and privacy policies as a multinational corporation when they actually have offices in the US and Canada and Brazil and India and the UK. And this idea of, is there just one view of what IT looks like, or is there going to be a, a, a smorgasbord of different multinational, national, regional uh, ways to consume IT and access IT services from your enterprise, depending on where you are in the world? This is a question that a lot of cybersecurity executives are getting pushed on by their boards right now. And they're looking to their vendors, to the market to help them resolve this complexity. Complexity being the theme here, right? It keeps coming up with each of these trends. We also asked enterprises and mid markets and, and SMBs, we asked them, how much visibility do you have today into total traffic in your network? And this is, think of this as a you know, security operations center in most large enterprises, somewhere there's a room where they have 30 people sitting who have eyes on glass all day, just watching a bunch of screens to see if they see any blips or anomalies. What was really interesting, yeah, no problem. What was really interesting to find out is that three years ago, the average company only had about 30% visibility into the total traffic and log volume in the enterprise. And if you think about millions of dollars that are being spent by banks and large companies in cybersecurity, the volume of that blind spot is pretty astounding. So today we're at something closer to 50% visibility. And as we move to the future, CISOs and cybersecurity buyers expect to have closer to 80% visibility. You could imagine that'll keep trending upwards asymptotically. But the idea there is 
with the number of devices that we all have increasing every day, the volume of data increasing, the more dependency that we have on digital, the amount of, of log volume is only going to increase as well. So this is really an exponential increase in how much data needs to be processed on a daily basis by a chief information security officer. So what does that mean? If you are a provider, you're a vendor of cybersecurity services, you're looking for AI and machine learning. You're looking for new techniques in analytics because you know that the volume of data is going to increase, the bad guys are only gonna get better and you need to help get ahead of this analysis. And, and um, one interesting implication here is, and why this is sort of an inflection point for cybersecurity executives is because one of the biggest pain points historically has been that security tools charge by the megabyte or by the gigabyte. They're charging based on volume. It is expensive to put more data into your security operation center. So the, the implication for providers and what they're starting to react to is how can they move away from this input-based pricing to more outcome-based pricing? And that's why one of the takeaways from, from this part of the presentation, again, is inflection point, disruption. We are seeing vendors start to price based on outcome and not based on input. And that could mean the time is right for your organization to move from this 50% to that 80%. We also looked at patents to get a sense of innovation. And we categorized every patent that was made globally over the past five years in the cybersecurity world into the different markets. And what we found was that, and it's, it's really no surprise, but it was quite interesting to see in the data, IoT and cloud and security operations, these fast moving trends in the top left of this chart, they're the segments where there is the least amount of patents today, but also the highest growth in annual patents that are being produced. Compare that to the right hand side of this chart, data protection, network security, identity, well, there's already a huge volume of patents there. So to some extent, right, the, the growth rate just won't be as high. But network security, right, we've had firewalls now for 30 years in enterprises. So the implication here being the time might be right now for your enterprise to think about data protection, network security, identity, because the pace of innovation is slowing there. It, it's reached saturation, and there are significantly more advanced capabilities there than there used to be. But as we look ahead, IoT, cloud, security operations, all of these to your security teams today might be blind spots or areas of just such high complexity, they don't know where to start. But you can expect that as innovation continues, we will see new technologies that come to market here and sort of take that as a sigh of relief. There might be new solutions. And then lastly is, it's very interesting in the security world where you have the branding of these security companies. You, you land in San Francisco airport and you see ads for a dozen different cybersecurity companies. We'll be going to the RSA conference in San Francisco in June where we'll talk to probably 500 security companies. Previously, there was this uh, new company formation trend, right? 9% growth in the number of companies that were formed in cybersecurity world every year. And in 2017, we actually saw an inflection point where the number of M&A deals or consolidation taking place among cybersecurity companies outpaced the growth of new cybersecurity companies for the first time. And that's in many ways, the nature of the market, you have new investment dollars going towards integration, but at the same time, it says something about emerge, uh, evolving customer preference. And this idea that, you know what, maybe 10 years ago, I needed a hundred tools because I didn't trust any of them. Well, now there are some trusted brands that are coming about that are consolidating these capabilities and offering you simplicity of being able to consume multiple capabilities from a single workbench. And this also a bit of a sigh of relief for those who are in charge of cybersecurity organizations. Maybe in the future, you'll be able to shrink that volume of tools down from 100 to 10. So to wrap up the section on where we are today in the market, we're at a critical inflection point. Complexity is increasing with regard to internal networks. Um, attackers are only getting more advanced, and we've seen that in the news with ransomware attacks that are targeting hospitals and mid-markets that don't even have security teams. So the implication for the cybersecurity providers is to make this simpler, to be more adaptive, to shift from just flagging where there's an issue to actually responding and getting ahead of that issue. Uh, and as well, we're seeing evolving customer preference for fewer solutions instead of more. So take that as a bit of a, we're at a critical inflection point. There is increased complexity, but the market is responding. And with that could be a bit of an opportunity for organizations to mature. Excellent. So I think now I have the exciting 
part to talk about where are where is cyber shifting and what are the trends that some recent analysis that we conducted, what were we able to see? But first, I'd love to pop up an additional uh, poll question, really thinking about, again, you know, just uh, along this scale of strongly agree to strongly disagree, whether or not companies are taking the steps they need to ensure security and the privacy of data that they serve. I guess it depends on whether or not they received a breach letter in the past. Uh, yeah, exactly, year. exactly. <laughs> Or if they get the daily updates right. that we receive. That's right. We'll leave this open for five more seconds and cast through this way. Okay. Go ahead and close the poll and display the results. Fascinating. A yeah, bit of a different, mix. a different mix put in there and just thinking about how it goes, but as you look at it, really you start seeing less on the strong side and you are seeing a bit of a pop up towards the, you know, I'm not really sure yet, which hopefully we can provide a bit of a conversation, especially as we shift to Justin's topics on the capabilities that will be needed in the future. But really as we go forward, as we shift, we had that sort of same view. So what are companies doing today? But actually what is the future gonna look like? Because as you've seen, it is changing, it is a complex environment, and we need to figure out in organizations, as companies, as academic institutions, as governments, they need to determine what are the future trends? What are the potential scenarios that I need to prepare for? And then how can I make sure that I secure my business? And so broadly what we did is we ran a set of analysis here that looked at four components. And the thinking was, what is the future of cyber? Well, then we had to actually take it back on what drives cyber, right? And what drives the risks that result in cyber threat scenarios, cyber activity, et cetera, et cetera. So we took a step all the way back to digital trends. And when we thought about these digital trends, we were looking at what is driving business, the digital transformation, analytics transformation, the cloud, DevSecOps, Agile, what are the business objectives and the business goals that we'll see between now and say 2050? And then as we think about that, we took it back and took a step, well, what is gonna enable that growth in the short term, next three to five years and five to 10 years? And that underpinning of the technology to those businesses is where that risk comes. So if my business wants to make a, wants to make a move, it wants to make a shift, wants to transform, well, it has to invest in a variety of components. The cyber risk comes from the technology. And then from that technology, you build out a core, we built out a core set of, well, what are the risks that could happen? What is the likelihood? What is the implications that could take place if worst, worst case comes to fruition or just what we might expect in the most likely course of action to be? And then finally, this created a set of future scenarios against which to invest Providers and vendors could invest in this side. Investors could think about investing in this technology, but more importantly, the businesses, as Justin will talk about, can start thinking about what do I need to put in place to stay ahead, to protect that value in those transformations that I are, I've been undergoing for um, a few years. So what I'd love to do is jump to the next page and really start thinking about the technology enablers that we identify. This came out of some recent research by the McKinsey Global Institute that looked at a set of technology trends and the potential growth that we may see over the coming decades. And a few that I would like to really highlight here are just thinking about the role of 50% of today's work activities are going to be automated in the future. So the individual will be taken out of these roles potentially, or at least some of their daily activities will be automated in a way that allows for more, rap more rapid impact and more rapid use of the sort of frontline type activities that you would see. This is going on all at the same time that we are able to reduce, or we believe there will be a reduction in software development and the analysis and the analytics go, go behind that by 30 times, right? All at the same time that we're gonna start seeing 
more and more data being processed at the edge or in the cloud, as Jeff started talking about, in the expansion into that, that spot. And so you start seeing all of these components, additional data, all of the technology that enables our work to get done faster, more efficiently, and more effectively to increase our business value, that you could start end up seeing some serious trends around what is the technology that comes into play, as well as what are the potential uh, risks that you could see coming out of here. And what we'd like to do actually is do a bit of a double click into here and start thinking about where are some more of what, as we take that, what are some of the increased sort of trends that came out of here and the increased impact based off of that data and where we see the technology growth. And so as you look across here, there's a few that I think are really relevant to this audience. So I think the first one is really thinking about next level process automation and virtualization. The role of one augmented reality or virtual reality workspaces, this sort of rapid growth of nanobot enabled manufacturing and then tying to dynamic supply chains and understanding the role of the supply chain and being adapt to supply chain crises like we're seeing today in a much faster and more effective way to reduce the supply chain risk we see and make sure that we have a more efficient overall processing of, of goods. The next thing I, I think I would really like to highlight is the distributed infrastructure. And this again, it, it's reinforced by the market decisions and the market investments that the research Jeff led identified. And you could see an increase in the as a service type technology proliferation. And so it's taking, there's more services being provided. The exact same time we're shifting further and more workloads to the crowd, to the cloud, trusting to put more data out in the cloud while we're also increasing the ability to output a variety of our controls, infrastructure and compliance requirements out as code to really ensure that there's more effective implementation of, of these, but that also does increase some risk, which we will talk about shortly. And then finally, on the right hand side, I think that, you know, when we were doing a bit of our prep calls here, this is some of the exciting stuff for many of you. There's not just the future of artificial intelligence, it's actually the applied AI and how you start seeing this from fully autonomous vehicles, you start thinking about future, you know, the future of smart cities and what you can start seeing as these cities grow. There are a few in, in the US, but being able to adapt and overcome there. And this is many times enabled by really how our programming is gonna shift. So as we increase complexity within artificial intelligence, right? This will actually play a bit of a role within some self-learning code, self-healing code, the ability to do low code, no code type solutions. And then finally the use of open source, Right, all of which, and we'll talk about this shortly, do have a bit of cyber uh, concerns that I think many of us have seen in recent years, especially those who were involved in the Log4j uh, issues. And then finally, and I know there were some questions on this, is really the role of trust architecture. So this is where you start thinking about, you know, crypto, blockchain, the role that that plays, as well as starting to think about zero trust which is a bit of a buzzword, but ties into a lot of the capabilities that Justin will talk about. And it has some uh, serious requirements for the security side. Excellent. So what does this mean? Well, this starts creating a set of security challenges as you look at investing here. And while this is a complex slide to display a set of complex uh, potential cybersecurity challenges as Jeff talked about, we do want to really focus your eyes to the right. What we did here is we, we, and we looked at the technology enablers, which were built out of a set of market trends, was built out of the McKinsey Institute research, and then some additional patent analysis beyond that, as well as academic uh, writing and research and government investment type analysis to be able to pull in and see what those trends were, what was the most popular. And this really ties into a core set of cyber challenges that we're able to take together and group into actually a set of potential scenarios going forward. And so what I wanna do is actually spend some time on this page. 
So these are what we see on the left-hand side with these unsolved challenges that came out of the technology, right? And so number one is, is identity and just sort of the mass proliferation of identities. What does this mean? It's not just you and me on the phone. It's not just Justin, Jeff, and Charlie as an identity. It's also the fact that there are machine identities, there are bots, and then you will also have identities within artificial and augmented reality environments. And then on top of that, you're also adding in that, that we have multiple identities across numerous systems and they're not connected. And so each individual has multiple identities is who they are uh, within the logical world. As Jeff talked about too, I won't really highlight this again, but I just wanna, this expansion of attack surface area, what this means is that you're just expanding where your data is held, where your business's data is held, and it creates complexity for security, but it also increases the ability to actually for the hacker to get in and identify what is going on. And so what you end up seeing coming out of here is the potential that networks will need to be rebuilt to create better security as part of these transformations. And this is one of those core elements you need to identify sooner rather than later, given the amount of time it takes and the amount of investment you have to do. There's we a question also, here that fits in before you move on. Sure. What industries do, uh, do you see most at risk, cyber risk currently, and then going into the future? So I think it, it, it ebbs and it flows. The recent news, I, I think it would probably be the most impactful and probably the most likely to harm all of us. Obviously, many, you know, this weekend on Saturday is actually the one year anniversary of Colonial Pipeline. And so when you start thinking about our energy, both in terms of the power generation and transmission, when you start thinking about oil and gas and the reliance that we have on that as a society to be able to move around, and then you tie into there and you actually look down a little bit around H, which actually gets into the splintering between the business IT and operation, information technology and operational technology teams. And you think about the fact that for those of you who operate within the operational technology space, it's older. It requires more third parties. The attack surface is spread out and there's less security built into that, that the threat to those environments may actually sort of accelerate in a way that is, is that could have impact on our day-to-day -day as the colonial pipeline hack did last year for much of the Southeast and the Eastern seaboard. Yeah, maybe just to, to tack on to Charlie, I, mean, I think what you're, what you're illustrating is the, the impact of critical infrastructure. Their it, critical infrastructure was, was defined by a presidential directive and it, it constituted 16 different uh, sectors and industries. Uh, there was recently a, a bit of regulation that came out called CERCIA, and I'm not going to bother defining the acronym because it's, it's long and it's complex, but, <laughs> but basically what, it, what CERCIA, is, the proposed legislation is, is it, for those who fall into one of those 16 critical infrastructure categories, defines a, a timeline for disclosing breaches to the government. Also, the SEC came out with a similar uh, regulation that is, that is being, being proposed and implemented, uh, it, for, for disclosure within, within either 48 or 72 hours. And right now, the, the timeline is a little bit uncertain. What you need to disclose is uncertain. Yeah. Um, you know, the level of communication and transparency is uncertain. But the, the point of me mentioning that is that your, your question is a good one around susceptible sectors and industries. And at least from a public policy standpoint, it's the 16 that uh, covered under the presidential directive. And I'll add maybe just one, one flavor to that is if I were the head of cybersecurity for any one of our organizations, I would look to my suppliers and my SaaS software providers. So I, my answer to this question would, to add on to Charlie and Justin, the software industry overall, we saw this with the SolarWinds attack last year, and you have attackers that are looking for intermediary routes into organizations yeah. where they can dwell, they can collect data, they can use one company that's connected to a million to get access to a million. And you've seen historically this development of a, a bug bounty market that's looking and rewarding folks that are finding these vulnerabilities, but nation states collect them. So you end up with, I'm sure today there are still thousands of, of live uh, vulnerabilities that could allow an attacker through an intermediary software provider or hardware to then get into 
uh, its end customers organizations. And, and I think that's a really good point that Jeff made is when you think about these threats and the challenges that exist, cyber threats and cyber hackers, whether nation states, criminal groups or hacktivists, they are also operating as a business. And so they are looking for the most return on their investment. And that's why you've seen the shift in ransomware from not just pulling out and locking everything to have money as we saw return to them, as we saw in NotPetya. With Maersk and Merck a few years ago, you're actually now starting to see a desire where they will then pull data out as well to sell that data on the dark web if they don't, if they don't receive the ransom. So they get some return back. And so again, it comes back to as well as Jeff said, if I can break into one company and suddenly have access to millions, I have just increased the return on my, my, my investment in terms of my talent I put in place, my R&D that I've invested in the risk that I took. I've just increased that exponentially. So why wouldn't I target within those specific areas? You make the attackers sound like business, but <laughs> well, I mean, because it they is are. a business, yeah. you know, when you when you start thinking about it, right? They, they, yeah, so there's a profiteering component. It's it, it's uh, it's criminal gangs, and they and you know, and they want to succeed um, as well. And so you have to, as a defender, have to think about that and what is their specific motivation. It's business disruption. We've outlined the tech, the way they do that is through technology, and we're able to get it here, which leads to these future scenarios. And I think just being mindful of time, you know, I think there's a few here just to highlight to leave with all of you to think about as you look at that digital future and where your organizations are, where you're, they're going to go, whether it's making investments, whether it's how you're going to govern this from a business leadership standpoint, or how you think about the legal impacts of all of these decisions. On this right hand side are some of the risks and some of the components you may have to think about, right? It's the supply chain and it's not just the physical supply chain. It's the software supply chain and a big push on software bill of materials now coming out of the recent uh, President Biden executive order. It's a shift to what does the, the chief information security officers organization look like? Are they reporting directly to the CISO or excuse me, the CEO and the board? Are they moving up or are they fully embedded within the business? to make sure that security is part of every single business process. And then the far right is, a, is one that I always like to refer to as the office space problem, which is algorithmic distrust. We know that many organizations think about their, the, the algorithms that they use to conduct their business, whether it's mortgages and lending or being able to provide health insurance and trying to remove bias and making sure that they are fair. Right, but then there's an element of actually, how do we trust this? How do we know it's real? And if a hacker can get in and disrupt the integrity of a model, disrupt the integrity of your data, what does this mean? And what are the actual costs, the effectiveness of your business? If you take it all the way back to the digital trends and the data we've seen, automate, automation relies on this. Most of your investments will rely on this and you can't get to what you see on the left-hand side if you don't trust the data that's going in. So now I'll pass it over to Justin, who will be able to talk about the so what and how do we actually solve this? You know, I think I painted a bit of a bleak picture, but <laughs> really the good news is we know where that bleakness may come, <laughs> right? And so Justin's going to give you that umbrella. Oh, goodness. All right. Well, while we talk about how bleak the future is, maybe, uh, <laughs> fill in, uh, we can fill in this, this poll. Uh, I believe cyber defenders, you know, those who are, who are taking proactive steps to protect us, are blank attackers. The cyber defenders are ahead of the attackers. Are they reasonably outpacing? Are they just sort of keeping up? Are they falling behind the attackers? Or are they way behind the attackers? We'll leave it open for five, five seconds. OK. All right, let's close the poll and see where things came in. Nope, no wrong answers. Keeping up with, OK. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, you know, what's, what's stark to me is that nobody said far ahead yeah. of, and I think I would agree with that. It's, it, it is an ever escalating arms war between cyber defenders and cyber attackers. And, you know, we're, we, we have traditionally been in a defensive posture. Um, and we know that the, the, the risk
rate that companies have invested has not been commensurate to the, uh, the sophistication and the rate of the attacks, the novelness of the attacks that have come in. And that's thus we have proliferation and, and increase of zero days that have fundamentally disrupted the businesses uh, of today. There was a question in the chat that I was waiting until this poll question to answer, which asked about because of consolidation and M&A, are we expecting that we're at a saturation point for innovation in cybersecurity? And the answer to this question is exactly why I believe the answer to that question is no. It's because it's not a static environment that we're protecting. The attackers are getting better and innovating just as the defenders are trying to. And for that reason, even with M&A and consolidation, there's still a ton of room ahead of us when it comes to innovation. Awesome. Okay, I'm gonna keep us <clears throat> moving along. I know we're running tight on time and we wanna leave, leave a few minutes for questions. So I, I'll, I'll run through this section fairly efficiently, but recall, this is what our cybersecurity organization look, looks like. So when somebody asks you the question, hey, what does good cyber look like? You can say it's actually these eight functions. And we're gonna just do a, a quick flyby on what these are. So first, strategy program management performance. Think of this as the operations of running the cybersecurity organization from finance management and talent management and communications. But the other thing that it, that it, that the capability that res, resides within this function is this notion of business relationship management, which includes things like the business information security officers, those people that sit within a business unit and help the organization, the products, and the people plan for how to secure their particular business unit. Really, really important function. They're also the people that sort of plan and strategize what do we need to be thinking about for the future and, and create a risk profile that, that's commensurate with the investment profile. Governance, risk, and, and compliance, or GRC, this is composed of a bunch of different functions, but fundamentally the group that manages the cyber risk on behalf of the organization and consolidates it, identifies it, helps the organization disposition the various risks, starting with what are, what are our policies and standards? What do we believe we should do? Where do we stand relative to uh, a cyber, our, our belief in cyber? Do, should we take a strong stance or a very open stance? And it just, it just sort of depends. Every organization is a little bit different. Identity and access management, you know, this is, this is such an interesting uh, topic and an interesting thing because the, of some of the trends that, that Jeff and Charlie talked about is the explosive growth in identities and just the, un, um, the, the, the way in which access to resources and assets within the environment, the servers, cloud, computers, endpoints is, is managed is incredibly complex. So this, this notion of, of who, who has access to what and what do they have access to is a really, really, it's a, it's a very challenging issue. And so the IAM group, the IAM department, the IAM organization are those who tackle that challenge. Okay, the fastest growing organization, I believe in any security organization, architecture and engineering. These are the, the people that sit back and look at the landscape just as an architect would and said, how do we plan for the future? How do we embrace the cloud? How do we know that our production lines are secure? How do we embed security into our products and services? Uh, and, and, and what are those, those uh, controls and measures of protection that we can put into place? This group has been growing and expanding. I'm, I remember when I got into cybersecurity 20 years ago, it was pulling teeth, convincing people that we needed an architecture function uh, and an engineering function. But this is the group that is, is uh, making cloud happen and adopting emerging technologies in a very, very real way. Okay, next on our tour of good cybersecurity organizations is security operations and response. Think of this as the security operations center, uh, the organization, the group, the function that takes in and ingests all the log data that Jeff talked about and puts in place uh, response um, measures when they see something flash across their screen that they know that it's something that they have to respond to. They also perform investigations. They do active threat hunting for things that are going on in the environment, trying to simulate uh, the uh, attacks and, and looking for, for different things that happen within the environment. This is a really, really important group. Cyber resilience and recovery. 
So this is the group that gives you the comfort to sleep at night because you can, if, if this group is doing its job well, you know that you can recover and that you are resilient from destructive and disruptive attacks. Next is data protection and privacy. We know that the regulatory landscape, privacy, and the way in which we protect, manage, encrypt uh, data is, is a key capability. And this is the organization that, and the group and the function that thinks through that. And then finally, this may look odd as we're talking about cybersecurity, but I would, I would suggest to you that physical security and safety is converging with cybersecurity for, for many organizations. Why? The nature of the controls are all electronic these days, are all digital. And so if somebody walks into a physical environment and badges into a door and they've just signed on to their, their VPN in another part of the world, you know that that may be unauthorized activity. Converging these functions and converging the physical and digital world it allows us to apply a measure of protection that I believe, that, that we collectively believe, is going to be a differentiator for, for most organizations. So now that we've done our tour of cybersecurity, let me give you sort of a sense of, of what we did next. Charlie talked about the cyber scenarios, these very bleak future, thank you, Charlie, for, for um, uh, that we need to future-proof, right? That we need to sit back and, and think about. We, I gave you a view of the capabilities. Now, these capabilities come together in an investment profile to form different recipes, right? So there's 11 scenarios that we talked about, eight core capabilities that power security organizations, and about 67, don't get too attached to that number because those change pretty regularly, but about 67 sub-capabilities that when activated come together to form recipes. So let me talk about 10 recipes that we've seen over the course of the cyber transformations that we've done. And I'm not gonna take you through all the detail of this, but a, you know, a couple of things that, I, that I'll highlight as I, as I sort of go through the, the three top steps you can take today. So the first thing you can do to future-proof your organization is invest in talent and empower your leaders. Just giving your cybersecurity leaders a seat at the table and teaching them how to engage with the business through leadership development programs. I know it sounds simple, it may sound intuitive, but it is so absolutely critical. Knowing your users and your nth party, I, I originally when I wrote this slide, it was third party, fourth party, fifth party, but it's really your nth party ecosystem um, as to who has access, who is in your network and how secure are they. Some of the things that you can do is investing in strong IAM capabilities. You can't protect them if you don't know they're there. And then inventorying and risk assessing all your third parties who have access to things in your network. Just getting a good view of that will, will, come a, will, will, will help you tremendously. Defend your assets and your data, absolutely. Understand where your crown jewels are. Understand what data you wanna protect. Can, can I jump in quickly? Because I course. think that this is a really good point. So Torsten, you asked a question around spending on information security as a bottomless pit. There's a couple components here that we actually think is important. And one of the ways to think about it is where is the biggest risk to my business and where does my business sit or where within the business does that sit? And the core element on this is really thinking about where are my crown jewels? What matters most to the operation of my business, whether it's a system or the data relies on the system? And then what is the likelihood of a breach there or a threat or, or a, a risk actually occurring? And that's where you invest in se to your, your security and put in and implement one of these recipes with the specific controls and capabilities to secure that crown jewel and reduce that risk. But until you understand where your crown jewels are, you can't effectively secure them. And so it's the same way as putting an entire bank within the vault versus just putting the most valuable assets in there and having the deposit slips out for anyone to take. And so that's the way you should think about it. You wouldn't secure them all at the same level uh, in a physical world and you shouldn't in a logical world as well. So I just wanted to take that opportunity. Thanks, Charles. Okay, I'm gonna breeze through the rest. You know, and you can tell we're all passionate about this topic. We, we could talk about this all day and I would invite any conversations that you'd like to have with us, certainly after this, but I'll highlight just, just two more um, that are really, really important. 
So plan for disruption and practice from scratch recovery. So perform crisis simulation and board games is one of the best ways that you know if you're ready. Gathering all your board, gathering your executive stakeholders and running through a what if scenario to know if, we're, if you're ready uh, if a crisis, a cyber crisis were to happen. Adopting a cloud first mindset, we believe fundamentally that cloud is the answer to, not the reason for uh, increase in cyber attacks uh, and, and, defend, and, and increasing your security risk profile. Um, if you look at the majority of the issues that have happened in the cloud, it's due to end user configuration and not the novelness of the attack. And so we believe adopting a cloud first mindset will, will actually be the step change that most organizations need in doing it the right way. Uh, and one way to do that is building secure landing zones and controls that inherit all of the, the pre-configured ways in which a cloud can be secured. Okay, real quick before I before I turn it over to Angie for a few more questions and, and, and a close up here. We know that cybersecurity is key to building trust in the digital age. We know that cyber threats will continue to evolve. We know that there are future steps that organizations can take uh, in order to future proof. Um, it's hard though, it's, it's hard to do that. It's hard to find um, the right platform to make that business case. It's hard to find mind share on behalf of the board and the executives. It's hard to know where to invest in, you know, in, the, different, um, in the different capabilities. In order to do that, you know, two things I, I wanted you to take away is know yourself, know yourself as an organization and the capabilities, that model that we put up there, the eight and the 67, and which ones exist within an organization and for, be able to forecast the future as to what the impact of various trends are to each one of those capabilities. We think that that exercise that we went through is a really important one to be able to say, are we ready? Are our capabilities ready to embrace the challenges of the future? With that, we have one last polling question. I'm gonna turn it over to Angie while we do this, but just if, if you don't mind, we'll, we'll launch the poll. And if you, if I appreciate you answering, I believe most cybersecurity organizations today are taking the right steps to overcome future digital challenges. Angie, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, everyone. Let's see what these, these responses are. There, I wanna remind people that uh, it's not that we haven't seen your questions when you, when you've planned ahead, you do know the question answer is coming. So some of these have been taken care of live. Um, but I'm interested in one, one question that was here from the beginning. Uh, how do you see the cybersecurity fit within the cyber defense program more generally? And I, I know that's sort of a, could be a very lengthy answer, but I don't want to uh, skip that because I do think it's important. And uh, then unfortunately you've got about a minute, maybe two. Um, but if you could take on uh, that question from Sean, please. Yeah, I, yeah I'll take the, the first crack at it. And, and I think if, if I read Sean's question in the, in the Q&A, um, there was a sort of a, an, an implication of a, um, um, or there were, if it wasn't Sean, it was, it was somebody else who talked about um, building security from the ground up. First off, I see cyber, as cyber defense as a part and parcel to the cybersecurity program implicit in one of the one or many of those capabilities that we talked about. So it's it's not separate, it is, it is certainly integrated with. As we, we talked about what the future of cybersecurity looked like, there were two edge scenarios on either side of the spectrum that we, we thought about. And you know, it was, it was a sort of an existential Nicholas Carr related IT doesn't matter type of question. Does cybersecurity go away in the future or does cybersecurity become more prominent and more important? We recognize both within IT as IT professionals and cyber professionals that if, if we're doing our job right, you don't need a cybersecurity organization. Okay, but a lot of assumptions and a lot of things need to happen. And unfortunately, we live in a world of reality where those things just don't manifest. And so is it better than to take those things and make that an organization's full time job and focus. And I think over time, it has proven that that is really the way that we believe we're going to overcome these challenges, that cybersecurity doesn't go away. We actually believe it becomes far more important and far more capabilities will come into a cybersecurity organization's remit. Hopefully that answers your question. Okay, so I want to give everyone a, an option here to 
throw some more questions in the Q&A. Otherwise, I'm always happy to go uh, through a couple of these that are here. But I know there might be some questions um, you know, that have developed now that you've seen the full presentation. I do have one other one that's been in the chat or the Q&A for a while. And that's the role of uh, the cyber insurance, the cybersecurity insurance. And um, so if you could just give some comment on how you think that that impacts what you're talking about. And then of course, you know, is this preventing future development of the market? What kind of impact is that having as well? Yeah, maybe I can start and then Charlie, I'll yeah, okay. right. pass, pass it to you. Cyber insurance has, has been in an, an evolving product over the past few years. When, when it came on the scene, it was an add-on product to policies that was almost like a no-brainer. It was cheap, it was easy to get, and you know, few, few people really exercised their, their, the terms of the policy. But as, as we started to see breaches become more destructive and disruptive, more and more companies were cashing in on their, on their policy and activating the policy. And then they became more costly, insurance premiums started to rise, insurance companies needed to start to price out those policies according to risk, perform, get into the companies and perform independent assessment, assessments themselves, and it became much more onerous. Fast forward to today, cyber insurance uh, policies are expensive, and um, more and more restrictions are being, um, being applied to them. So in most cases, you can't uh, get reimbursed for, uh, for paying the ransom. And that is sending a signal to attackers and to the market that ransoms will not be paid. And, and that's consistent with what we're, what we're seeing. It's a, um, and so in the conversations that we're having with, with companies, it is an inflection point, I think, for cyber insurance as a product uh, as to whether or not cyber insurance is valuable enough to continue, to continue in its current form or whether or not it has to change to provide more substantive value. Uh, to two companies, um, so it's it's an interesting time to be to ask that question. We ask that question a lot. We talk to a lot of insurance companies to figure out kind of what they're doing to make cyber insurance much more proactively valuable uh, than just providing some measure of protection under certain conditions. I mean, I think that's. I would love to get to some of the other questions, and I think you covered that. It's not going to add anything. More okay, I, I would say one one more thing, which is that the reason why everything Justin said is true, but why so many companies do have cyber insurance today, is because in many cases, if that company is a vendor of products or services, they are asked by their enterprise customers, "Do you have cyber insurance?" Yeah. As, as part of the diligence and assurance process. So it's sort of a checkbox, and what we're talking about is how it could evolve to become more strategic. Yeah. Well, I actually think that's an interesting point too. Many times, and I see this in two questions. Um, I think Gotham's question a little bit here, as well as the the one on M and A and is bigger better. We see sort of we talk about asset sprawl and technology sprawl, but a lot of times organizations will make an investment in something, a large cyber insurance mm -hmm. policy, a new technology, and they won't have a breach and they feel secure, and no one wants to make the decision to remove it. So they keep adding on more and more point solutions and cyber insurance is one of those we've had conversations with folks about how much do i have do i self-insure and how do i think about it but leadership doesn't want to take it off and that same same thing lots of point solutions how do i make sure i have the right coverage how do i make sure that i am assured that they will work in the way that they're supposed to work yeah. hopefully that, that answers your question or a few hours was, that was our take out and it's a, it's a great question very very good question I think this is a great follow on um, taking us down slightly different path, but how do you plan for disruption and practice from scratch in this continuing uphill battle environment against bad actors? Yeah, yeah, great. It's a, it's a great question. I, we, we know from, from some of the, the incidents that we've, we've been involved that one of the first places an attacker will go after is your backups. Right. They, they, if, if you're, they, they're maximizing the likelihood that, that you will pay their ransom because they want you scared that you cannot recover. They also, and, and they also know that the data that they have in their possession uh, will, will give them a, a leg up in, in, if, if they can either encrypt it or embarrass or, or, or shame. In, in practice, the very, the very first thing is making sure that your backups are immutable, are separated, and are inaccessible by the attacker. Now, 
that is that is a hard thing to do because you want to try to have your backups as close to the production system as possible for efficiency, for effectiveness, for performance. But that closeness to the production system also is what makes it extremely susceptible. So in a traditional legacy on-prem infrastructure, when you think about that, that is easy to do by putting things in close proximity but making sure that they're disconnected from the network is, is, is a little bit more challenging. When we think about the cloud, it's, it's a, it, it certainly is a lot easier to do because you have the ability to send data back and forth, maintain good resiliency through multi-region uh, multi and uh, multi-zone hosting, um, but making sure that, that your backup is on a fundamentally different network, a fundamentally separated network. And here's the, here's the other thing. Most organizations that we'll, we'll run into have never done a full restore test of their system from scratch, a bare metal test of what do we do, how long does it take, where do we go, and what have we lost depending on how long things have been down. That is an important, a critical test to do as you look sort of at the, at the full range of systems that are mission critical. To your and, and I think to get into a little bit of what Jess was talking about, you know, we recently served a large technology company and they were thinking about as I transform my organization and as I shift, I want to think about secure by design and my development processes. I want to think about privacy by design and my development processes. And then we started thinking, I want to think about resilience by design. So when you're designing systems, when you're designing business processes, applications, investing in that technology to support the business objectives, you've also got to build in that resilient nature to it. How do I think about where are they stored? Am I a Texas company and I'm trying to store something in, in, in Houston and Dallas? Well, that won't work if all the power goes out given their grid. And so you have to be strategic about how you build in the resilience, but you've got to play a little bit of catch up, right? On sort of the legacy and the resilience debt you have, understanding where your crown jewels and prioritizing those first based off of your business continuity priorities is probably really good. But then there's, as I'm moving forward and thinking about the next set, how do I integrate the resilience into the actual development and design process? You just don't want to wait for a breach to force you to answer those questions. No, no. It's a little too late at that point. So a follow-up from that, uh, how do I make sure my own clients, customers, data, et cetera, are secure? Own clients, customers. I think it's more about just the, the so, so there's always the question, right? We call one of our colleagues who's, you know, one of our, one of our colleagues, we call him a skeptic. It's always, how do you really know? Right, and, and our view is there's a core set of controls, there's the recipes that Justin went over, but then you've actually got to go in there and test them. You've got to run the technical testing on what you expect it looks like, right? It's, you know, I'm one of those people when I leave my house, I think my door is locked, but I check to make sure it's really locked. Can I get in? I push, I wiggle, I move the door around. You've got to do the exact same thing to make sure it's secure. And you've got to bring in people from outside the environment to come through and actually poke and prod and see if they can get in there and not just check the front door, but go around and check the kitchen window, the basement, can they get in the garage and work their way all the way through to test that data across a variety of controls. And then, you know, technically it's sort of the MITRE attack framework, thinking about the various attack paths that are gonna be taken and the controls you need to check to make sure that they're there. But until you do that technical testing, to make sure the controls work as designed and as you believe they're executed are effective and have the full coverage, you will never fully know. You may have a good idea, but you will never know. I'll say, I know very few CISOs who sleep very well at night. I know many <laughs> who are confident and comfortable, but they recognize they, did I lock the door? And they've run those continuous tests. I'd also be willing to bet that 80% of folks who are on this call have the password to one of their personal email accounts in a, a paste bin somewhere. Yeah. So the conversation has shifted, right? Where it used to be, how do we avoid any personal data from ending up somewhere in the, the multiverse? To now let's assume that there is, is some element of data about each and all of us that's accessible. And then therefore it's incumbent on then the customers to have, you know, be able to 
make decisions to protect themselves. Yep. The implication being that it's incumbent on the providers and companies such as yourselves to then offer your customers those tools. So if there's a way to offer multi-factor authentication, it, it, you'd be remiss not to. If there's a way like the Facebook privacy checkup where you can go in and you can uncheck things that you no longer want visible, it's putting more of that control in the hands of your customers. The last thing that you wanna do is have a breach take place and blame one of your third parties. Oh, it, it wasn't us, it was yeah. them. They, they don't care if you outsourced your, your back office accounts payable processing. If your customer's data ended up there, it's, it's still it's, going to impact your reputation. I, and I, what I think, and, and just to add on to, to what Jeff said, you want to be secure, but not to the point, you know, when you think about these trade-offs and the customer journey and the customer experience, you want to be secure, but you don't want to be so cumbersome with your security that it's really difficult to use your product. Um, because then folks may try workarounds. You also want to be able to provide multiple options on how to access their data, how to secure their data, and then make sure your teams are monitoring that and controlling. Again, it comes back to the physical security part, right? And thinking about fraud and, and all of that. Um, you know, if, if I just made a transaction in Chicago, Illinois, and then suddenly I'm making one in the middle of Germany three minutes later, right? Maybe there's an alert that comes through there to be able to protect my data. Where this gets to though, is sort of this, this holy grail concept that we've had discussions about of security as a competitive value proposition. At what point do consumers yep. make choices of, am I gonna buy my groceries from this store or that store based on what they know about their security posture? And you know, WhatsApp is a great example. They were the first of the communications platforms to move to end-to-end -end encryption. Actually, that, that same quarter they made that decision was the largest spike in their uh, number of active users they ever had. Well, there are still several questions uh, in the Q&A, but we are coming up to end of time. So I want you to know there's at least a couple in here that I think I'm going to nudge everyone to take a couple moments to be sure you've gotten a response for. Um, and don't forget, there are, of course, follow-up opportunities that are always present after these webinars. But let me just, just say what an honor and a privilege it's been to listen to you today. This was amazing, comprehensive, so forward thinking. It's, it's just wonderful to, to hear this. So Justin, Jeffrey, and Charlie, just thank you so much. What a wonderful opportunity you've given us today. And I'm sure I'm not the only one who will be going back to view this video uh, again in the future. Uh, thank with you. that, I'm going to turn it to June for one last uh, bit of notes. All right. Thank you so much, Angie, for moderating this panel. I've learned a lot. And thank you, Justin, Jeff, and Charlie. Would you try to like maybe shake hands or do something weird so we can see all three of you are together? <laughs> That's really fun, actually. I really like this format of uh, uh, the panelists. Uh, so they're physically sitting next to each other, but actually we only see one of them at each screen. So Justin, uh, could you uh, unshare your slides? I have two more to wrap up today's lecture. All right, thank you so much. I was panicked on Monday when Justin and I did a quick run through. I feel like I knew literally nothing about cybersecurity. I was worried about my audience. I feel like I learned a lot. At least I feel comfortable about learning more. I think that's the most important thing. And let me see. I'll share my screen right here. All right. Do you see my screen? Cool. So today we conclude this mini series on uh, data and technology. So this is number three, and this is the last one on data technology, given that how much I've learned today. So maybe we should venture out a little bit more often of our, uh, our comfort zone to learn more about uh, important aspects related to corporate governance, like SEC's change in disclosure rule of ransomware. I think that's an important aspect uh, the corporate, uh, corporate board should factor in and the chief security or chief information technology officer. I think this is also a very important overall architecture of um, strategies and designs within a corporation. So to wrap up what we have done so far, we started this series since last November. So we did the ESG, we did the board monitoring, we did investors engagement and monitoring. So that's the indexers and uh, hedge funds. And in the coming year, we're still working on the schedule. We are thinking about climate risk, 
Uh, we're going to touch on compliance and white collar crimes, insider trading, and an announcement of future lectures will be followed soon. And if you have any topics to suggest, if you have any speakers to suggest, if you want to speak on our series, please reach out to us. Uh, thank you again for our partners, uh, the co-hosts of ECGI, European Corporate Governance Institute, especially Marco and Elaine, uh, for your wonderful help to make this a successful series. Thank you, Scott and Angie from IU uh, Austrian's workshop uh, to co-host to co-host this event. And all of the materials, the recording, the slide deck, and Q&As, and the answers to the Q&As uh, are available on our website. And the email will reach out to you in a few days with all today's materials. Thank you again, Justin, Jeff, and Charlie. Thank you, Angie. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. Good night and early good morning to everyone. See you in the year of 2022 to 2023 in the fall. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.